Hi, welcome to class today. Today we're going to be learning about the French and Indian War. By the end of the video, there are three questions you're going to need to be able to answer. So let's get started. By the end of the video, you should be able to tell me one, what are the major long-term and immediate causes of the French and Indian War? Two, what were the different battles tactics used throughout the war? And three, what are the major effects of the French and Indian War? The French and Indian War began in 1754 and lasted until 1763. Its name can lead to some confusion. Students sometimes think the French and Indian War was fought between the French and the Native Americans, when in fact it was between the French and the British, each with their own Native American allies. Throughout much of their histories, Britain and France had been constantly at war to be the most powerful country in Europe. The French and Indian War was part of a larger global conflict, the Seven Years' War, in which Britain and France were fighting for world domination. So let's see how this war got started. By 1740, the population of the 13 colonies had grown to over 1 million people. Many of these colonists were small farmers and needed land to grow their crops. Due to overcrowding along the eastern regions of the colonies, people started moving west towards the Appalachian Mountains. Colonists along the frontier, or western edge of British territory, were searching for the best farmland to build lives for themselves and their families. So, the colonists began moving west into the Ohio River Valley, an area known for its rich, fertile soil and natural resources. Moving into the Ohio River Valley, however, was not without risks. First, it was located in French territory, west of the Appalachian Mountains. Remember, Britain and France were huge competitors for territory in North America, and they did not like each other. So, when British colonists started moving into the Ohio River Valley, which was French territory, they risked getting attacked by the French. Second, as British colonists moved further west, they encountered more Native American tribes living in the region. Many of these tribes had alliances with France. Remember, the French made friends with Native Americans when they settled in North America. As colonists pushed into the frontier, their homes and farms were being raided and burned by Native Americans, who didn't want colonists invading their space. Despite the risks, the British colonists moved further west anyways, determined to get more land for themselves. Tensions increased between Britain and France, and war became inevitable. In 1754, the French began constructing Fort Duquesne in modern-day Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The fort was built at the forks of the Ohio River, where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers meet to form the Ohio River. By building a fort here, France hoped to control access to the Ohio River Valley, the fertile areas surrounding the Ohio River. Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia sent George Washington, then a 22-year-old lieutenant colonel, and part of the Virginia Regiment to prevent France from capturing British forts along the Monongahela River. While encamped about 50 miles south of Fort Duquesne, Washington received a message from one of Britain's Native American allies, a Seneca chief named the Half King. He told Washington that there was a small group of French soldiers encamped nearby. Washington decided to attack. The Virginia Regiment was able to ambush the French and claim an easy victory. After the battle, Washington learned that the French leader, Monsieur Jumonville, was actually an ambassador sent to negotiate peace. Some reports claim that Schumanville was wounded during the fighting and reprimanded Washington for attacking because they were a diplomatic party. The half-king then stepped forward and bashed in Jumanville's skull. 
Other accounts claim that Jumonville was killed during the battle itself. Washington's men found diplomatic papers after he was dead. After the Jumonville incident, Washington knew the French would counterattack. He quickly made a defensive fort called Fort Necessity. Fort Necessity was not in the best location. It was in the middle of an open, low-lying field surrounded by trees. Soon, about 600 French soldiers and 100 Native Americans attacked the fort. The French were able to hide behind trees as they fired at the British. That night, Washington knew he couldn't win and surrendered to the French. After returning to Virginia, Washington was viewed as a failure and a disgrace. The Jumonville incident and the Battle of Fort Necessity were the sparks that ignited the French and Indian War. Now at war, colonists knew it would be some time before reinforcements could arrive from Britain. Representatives from seven of the 13 colonies agreed to meet in Albany, New York. They planned to convince the Iroquois Confederacy, a group of local Native American tribes, to join the British colonists in fighting the French. Since most of the Native Americans allied with the French were enemies of the Iroquois, they were eager to sign a treaty with the colonists. The representatives also created the Albany Plan of Union. The plan encouraged the colonial militias to work together to create one militia to protect against the French. Something like this had never been suggested. At the time, colonial militias did not interact. For example, the Virginia militia would never have fought to protect colonists in Maryland or North Carolina. To gain support for the plan, Ben Franklin created the Join or Die cartoon, which was published throughout the colonies. While the Albany Plan of Union was ultimately a failure, it was still important because it was the first time the colonies tried to work together to solve a problem. About a year after fighting began at the Battle of Fort Necessity, British soldiers finally arrived in North America. General Edward Braddock, a highly respected British general, was sent to lead the Virginia Regiment to conquer Fort Duquesne once and for all. Braddock was an old school British general. He believed war should be fought in open fields and soldiers should stand in straight lines. In Europe, this battle tactic worked well since most battlefields were in open plains. To capture Fort Duquesne, Braddock wanted to march his men including George Washington, who served as his assistant, 110 miles across the Allegheny Mountains with 10 cannons during the middle of summer. Braddock was mostly successful. He led his men to within 10 miles of Fort Duquesne. Braddock, however, made a fatal mistake. During the march, Washington warned Braddock that the French had adopted guerrilla warfare tactics from the Native Americans. Guerrilla warfare involves using your environment to sneak up and ambush your enemy. Braddock, however, saw this fighting style as ungentlemanly and uncivilized. He wanted to prove his old school fighting style would work and refused to believe the French would stoop to using guerrilla warfare. Then, on July 9, 1755, Braddock and his men were ambushed by about 900 French, Canadian, and Native American soldiers defending Fort Duquesne. Despite outnumbering the French, the British were unable to fight off the attack. Within one hour of fighting, Braddock was killed and Washington's horse had been shot out from under him. Washington was able to organize the survivors and lead a retreat back to Virginia. For his courage during the battle and leadership skills during the retreat, Washington became known as the hero of the Monongahela. Fighting continued along the frontier for several more years. Eventually, the British were able to seize control of Fort Duquesne. They renamed it Fort Pitt, hence Pittsburgh. Finally, in September 1759, the Battle of Quebec would determine the victor of the French and Indian War. Quebec was the French capital in Canada. The city was on top of a high cliff and heavily fortified. It would not be easy to invade. To capture Quebec, British General James Wolfe had a plan. 
One night, he transported 200 Royal Navy ships up the St. Lawrence River, which was just below the city. The British soldiers climbed the cliffs carrying two small cannons with them. The night was very foggy, so the French had no idea the British were there. The next morning when the fog cleared, the French found the British army just outside the gates of the city. The French leader, the Marquis de Montcalm, decided to attack the British on the Plains of Abraham, just outside the city gates. Remember when we talked about Braddock and his march to Fort Duquesne? The British loved fighting in open fields. This was playing to the British Army's strengths. Soon after the battle began, the French surrendered to the British. A few years later, fighting ended everywhere. Britain and France signed the Treaty of Paris of 1763, officially ending the Seven Years' War. Britain had won. In the terms of the treaty, Britain was given French territory in Canada and territory east of the Mississippi River, including the Ohio River Valley. France also had to give up its claims to territory west of the Mississippi River, Louisiana, to Spain, who entered the war in 1762. France was left with no territory in North America. After the war, the colonists were extremely proud to be part of the British Empire. They had just helped Britain become the most powerful country in the world. And they could move into the Ohio River Valley, the very territory they fought so hard to move to. But Britain was left with several problems. First, the Native Americans that were hostile to the British were still there. Native American raids and attacks on colonists continued, just as they had before the war. The British government knew it would be very expensive to send soldiers and build forts along the frontier to protect the colonists. So the British Parliament, or lawmakers, passed the Proclamation of 1763. This law forbade the colonists from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains, the very territory they had fought to move into. Many colonists simply ignored the proclamation and moved to the Ohio River Valley anyway. Second, the French and Indian War had put Britain in a lot of debt. The war had cost about 70 million pounds, which is about 14 billion dollars today. Britain needed to find a way to cover the cost of the war. So they decided to start taxing the colonists. After all, the war started to protect colonists from attack. They should help pay for it too. How do you think the colonists are going to react when Britain starts placing taxes on them? Remember, we talked about salutary neglect, that unofficial British policy where they pretty much ignored the colonies for 200 years. Are the colonists going to be okay with Britain taxing them all of a sudden? More on that in our next video, and I'll see you in class.